So I see at least six of you out there who should know all these things, and there will be a test afterwards. Um, several years ago, I attended a talk. Um, it was actually, I think it was in Portland. It was uh, Mark Jason Dominus, and he used this metaphor. And everyone in the audience looks at that picture, and, and some of you think, I know exactly what that is. I use it all the time. And the rest of you have no idea what it is. And this is Teflon tape. You put it on, on uh, plumbing threads when you screw two pieces of plumbing together, and it makes it easier. It makes it seal. And once you know about it, you use it all the time, and you think that everyone in the world knows about them. And so he sort of gave me the idea of this sort of talk, the, uh, the Teflon tape talk. It's all these things that once you know about them, you use them every day. And uh, the rest of you, you know, hopefully some of you will see some of these things and think, oh, I, I'd never known that, and that looks really useful. So that's, that's sort of the goal here. And I'm going to start with um, one that I've actually mentioned before this week. So if you've attended my talks, you've already seen this. This is the fallback resource directive. This is in 2.2.16, and this is what it looks like. Well, not really. You've all seen this configuration any time that you've installed WordPress or Drupal or who knows what all. And it says, if somebody requests something that isn't a real thing, then serve index.php instead. So it's sort of uh, what is referred to in computer science as a, a uh, front controller or a fallback resource. And uh, the trouble is that it doesn't always work. It can break embedded images. It can screw up your CSS if you don't do it quite right. So in 2.2.16, we added a directive called fallback resource, which does that same thing. And here's what it looks like. This directive says, uh, if somebody requests something and we're not sure what it is, send them here instead. <clears throat> Any, so now if you install WordPress and they give you this HT access file that you're supposed to put in your document root, you can delete that and replace it with that one line of configuration and everything works the way it's supposed to. So see, isn't that better? Um, and they do, they do exactly the same thing except fallback resource is not fragile. Number two. The server info handler is provided by a module called Mod Info. And this is a module that's been around forever and ever. And if you enable it in your configuration, it gives you a, a place where you can go get basic information about your server configuration. One of those things is if you access server info question mark config, it will give you a, a dump of what it believes your configuration file looks like. This is useful for a number of reasons. If you are not sure, you know, if your configuration is split over multiple files and you're not sure what order they're loaded in and you're not sure what overrides what, this gives you what it thinks your configuration is. It shows you uh, what line number and what file number everything came from <clears throat> and what order directives are applied in. So by the way, server info also has a couple other useful features. If you do question mark list, it shows you what modules you have loaded. And if you do question mark and then the name of a module, it shows you two things. It shows you what directives are available in that module and which ones you're using and where. So presumably, this would give you a quick way to say, am I in fact using this module? Because if I'm not, maybe I should unload it. A couple other ones, you can get a, hook of, a list of hooks, and you can get the server build information. So that's a cool feature. <clears throat> Number three, SNI. So it's, it's common wisdom. Everyone knows that you can't run name-based virtual hosts with SSL. And this is because SSL, the way it works is you have this server-client handshake that happens on the initial connection. And that happens based on the IP address. Um, well, more specifically, at the time of the connection, it doesn't know the host name. And so the certificate is sent before you know what host name you're talking about. SNI is something that's been in the Apache web server for a little while. 
um, it actually addresses this problem. The SNI protocol itself is a way to get around this limitation. This is a server configuration that does name-based virtual hosting using SNI. Yes, Igor is going to be a troublemaker. You said this is uh, a talk about news in uh, 2.4. Do we still need for SNI name virtual host? You know, I'm not sure, do we? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think Eric should, but he isn't here. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I'll have to try. Yeah, we should, we should try. We should update the documentation. <laughs> All right, um, so and then this is your, your virtual host, your uh, SSL virtual hosts will look the same as they've always looked. There's very little difference in configuration and the web server does the right thing, which is very cool. These are browsers that support this and uh, unfortunately this limits you a little bit if you're if your client base is still using IE6. Uh, the documentation, uh, as was just alluded to, is not entirely up to date on this particular feature, but it is discussed in the wiki at wiki.apache.org slash httpd, which is kind of our staging ground for new documentation. Uh, you might want to look there for things that are not updated in the official docs yet. I'm gonna go over this one real quickly because if you've been at any of the 2.4 talks at this conference, you've already seen this. We've added uh, per, per module log level configuration in 2.4 and that looks something like this. Log level, you specify the global log level and then you specify the log level for the specific module. This also replaces any modules that we're doing specific per module logging has now been moved to this general mechanism. And you can see the logs for a particular module by looking at for that module name in the global error log. I tend to think of it these days as the debug log rather than the error log because it contains so much more than just error messages. By the way, there's also a new error log format directive which allows you to specify the format of the error log. Yes. Uh, since you're mentioning error logs and now moving away from them, maybe uh, important news, um, 404s are no longer errors. So if you're looking for those in your log and they're not appearing, it's because we moved them to a different er uh, error level. Okay, and what is it now? The next one. The next one up, which is warn or no. crit or something. Inf info, I think. Info, okay, all right. All right, now, now here's something that everyone needs. This is an important new feature in 2.4. I need your attention on this. This is mod modem. And no, seriously. Um, this is a new module with 2.4. It provides uh, the functionality to, to run your server at speeds comparable to the old modem standards. And uh, this is the configuration. If you don't believe me, you just have to go look at the docs. <laughs> and uh, you can specify one of these four possible modem standards and it will run your, your web server at the appropriate speed for that modem standard. Um, yeah, okay, moving along. <laughs> Mod macro. This is exciting news. Mod macro is, has long been one of my favorite modules. It allows you to do stuff like this. You define a macro with one or more variables, and then you invoke that macro as many times as you want. This gets executed when the, when the server parses the configuration file, and it generates a, uh, a configuration based on that, which it then loads. This is a third-party module, and just recently, 
it was contributed to the HTTPD project. It is now in trunk and will be in the 2.6 release unless somebody backports it earlier than that. So if you don't want to wait, then you can in fact get it at, uh, oh, wrong slide. You can in fact get it at this URL, but uh, eventually this will be part of, part of the core release, which is exciting. Number seven. Index style sheet. So everyone knows that you can generate a directory listing on your website and it looks like this and it's kind of ugly. But what you can do is attach a style sheet to your directory listing and the auto-generated uh, directory listing will now incorporate whatever styles you wish to attach to it. So whereas before it was plain and ugly, now it can be incredibly ugly. So you can, uh, you can associate styles with all the different elements on that page. Um, the, the individual classes that you can define in your style sheet are, are in the docs. Uh, this is in there as of 2.2, this isn't a new thing. And these are some of the uh, classes that you can define, even an odd rows in your, in your listing table and columns and so forth. So, that's really nice. By the way, while we're talking about directory indexing, a uh, couple features that have been around since the very beginning that people seem to still be unaware of are the header name and readme name directives, which allow you to put a header and footer on your automatically generated directory listings in order to make it fit more cleanly into this, the style of the rest of your website. Uh, Proxy Balancer has also been around for a couple years. This is a way to use Apache HTTPD as a, as a load balancer between multiple backend servers. Those backend servers can be running HTTP, FTP, or AJP. And AJP is what Tomcat talks. So you can use this as a front end for any of those servers. They don't have to be Apache HTTPD on the back end. There's also a new module in 2.4 called Mod Heartbeat and Mod Heart Monitor. So Heartbeat runs on the back end, Heart Monitor runs on the front end, and it ensures that servers are still alive. If they aren't alive, then they get taken out of the proxy rotation. And as I mentioned, you can use Mod Proxy AJP to uh, proxy to a, a Tomcat server. There's also a balancer manager, which is a web-based front end to the, uh, to the balancer. So you can configure various settings on the balancer through that web interface. And I realized right before my talk that I have a very old screenshot of this, but if you can imagine it being exactly like this, only better in every possible way. Um, it allows you to do neat things like add additional workers into the process. If you bring up a new server on the back end, you can add that in. You can also persist your settings across sessions. Uh, in, in earlier versions, once you restart it, it would go back to your original settings, but in 2.4, you can persist any changes that you make over restarts, which is kind of neat. So here's an example balancer setting. You define a cluster with one or more backend servers, and then you proxy pass to that balancer. You can also specify different load factors if, if one of the servers is more powerful than another and you want to send more content, more data there, more requests there, rather. See mod proxy documentation for the full list of options. There are many different options about how you can load balance. You can load balance based on number of requests or total bytes sent, for example. I keep coming back to this one because this is my favorite feature in 2.4. This is the new if directive. It allows you to wrap any configuration lines in an if block so that they can be evaluated at request time and applied conditionally. Now here's a simple example of this. This says if the, rec if the host name requested is example.com, redirect to www.example.com. You can 
evaluate expressions based on request, response, environment variables, um, giving you, you know, a lot of flexibility. You can do, do it uh, based on methods. You can use syntax like in if you want to provide a list of things. The syntax is very full. Um, if you want to get involved in documentation, we'd love to see some of the things that you all are doing with this so we can actually put some examples in the doc instead of just a list of features. Number 10. SVN auto commit is a really cool feature that I started using when I was working briefly for a lawyer's office. And they wanted to have the ability to have every revision of every document saved for posterity. And so what we did was we had all of them map a web dev share and we turned on SVN auto versioning. And what that does is every time they press save on their desktop client, it creates an SVN revision on the server. They don't need to know how to use SVN. It just happens automatically. So this is uh, revision control for everyone, and they don't need to know how to use revision control. Now, one of the weird things about this is, although you have a revision number, you don't have any sort of commit message. Uh, but because of the way that SVN works, you can have that lawyer come to you and say, I want to know how this document looked at 2.30 yesterday, and you can get a checkout based on the timestamp so you can revert to any point in the past. So that was really cool, made them very happy. The caveats are that you're gonna use an enormous amount of disk space, particularly if you're checking in uh, Word documents. So binary files don't diff very easily and uh, you're gonna consume huge amounts of disk space. Number 11, mod ext filter. Uh, this is another neat feature that I don't know that there are many practical uses for, but I do have one really cool example here. I'm gonna start with the stupid example uh, because it's easier to explain. Mod ext filter allows you to define an external filter, and in this case I'm defining an output filter for text HTML type, and I'm going to replace, uh, I'm actually going to invoke sed at the command line to replace the Verdana font with the Arial font. So, silly example, I know. I'm going to apply that to all the content on my website to swap out a font. So yes, that is extremely silly, but um, let me show you a slightly more useful example that you might use in a development environment. Uh, one of the reasons that it's silly is invoking set on every request is not exactly the most efficient thing to do, as you might imagine. But here's a, a cool example. This uses the Enscript utility to take C source code and produce syntax highlighted HTML. So you could use this in a, in a uh, development environment to, to get a, a nice look at your code as you're working on it. And speaking of syntax highlighting, for those of you that are PHP developers, are there any PHP programmers here? Uh, a small number. Okay, here's a, a feature that uh, is, is part of PHP, not part of the Apache web server, but this is the handler that's provided by PHP language to do this. Syntax highlight your PHP code by just renaming your PHP files to PHPS, then when you view them in the browser, they'll be syntax highlighted. Unfortunately, in order to use it, you have to rename your PHP files to PHPS, and who wants to do that? So here's a way to do that a little bit differently. Um, we use a rewrite rule to say, if anybody requests a .phps file, just give them the PHP file, but syntax highlight it. Now, ideally, you wanna do this in some way where you're not exposing the source code of your whole website to random internet users, but uh, you know, that's, that's my authentication talk from yesterday. Log message. The log message directive allows you to create a log message. We're really good at these directive names. The log message directive uh, takes 
several arguments. Uh, one of them is the log message itself. The second one is the hook on which to log. And the third one is an expression which says, should I log? So in this case, I'm logging a message that said sub request to location foo. I am logging it during the type checker phase. And I'm only going to log it if the request was in fact a sub request. Here's another example. Um, I'm going to log the message there back if an, a remote address is, has the IP address of 1.2.3.4. I'm watching for a particular person to come back to my website and I want to explicitly call that out in my log file. And one final example of that, this is a, a case where I've expressed, I've, I've said hook all which means it's going to log this message on each of the hooks. And so it will log the evolution of a particular variable during the entire request as it moves from one phase to another. Number 14. By the way, if anyone has any questions or comments and is not Igor. You're, you're welcome. Well, of course, he's still welcome too, but, but please, please feel free to stand up and interrupt me because I don't expect to leave a lot of time at the end for questions, although, you know, with my luck this week, I'm going to run out of content anyway. <clears throat> we have a new syntax that was added in 2.3, so it's in the, in the 2.4 release, which allows you to combine multiple access control requirements much more easily than was possible before. And I covered this in some detail in my talk yesterday, but for those who weren't in there, we have the require any syntax, which allows you to express uh, several require statements and only enforce uh, one or more of them. One or more is sufficient. So in this case, either use one of these HTTP methods or be a logged in user. If you want to use some other method, you need to be a logged in user. I can say require expression. So in this example, I'm saying you can only access this content during business hours. I can require an environment variable. And I'm setting an environment variable using set env if, and then I require that environment variable for access. You can also require a fairly complex collection of things and combine them in whatever way you want using the require all, require any, and require none directives to create a very fine-grained access control mechanism. And then you can do the old allow from all and deny from all using the new require syntax. So these are all ways to not only make the require syntax less confusing, this was something that, that people have traditionally found many ways to get wrong, but also make it much more flexible. Number 15, check spelling. So you have a, uh, a good example is if you have a Windows, uh, you have content developers that are using Windows or some other operating system that has case insensitive file names and they provide content to you to run on your Linux box that has case sensitive file names. And of course, URLs are case sensitive. And uh, so you get a lot of 404s with wrong casing. These are, this is how you fix this. There's two possible directives here. One is the check spelling on directive and the other is check case only. So I'll start with the second one. Check case only says that if a, if a request comes in that is not satisfied by, a, by content from the file system, we're gonna look to see if maybe there's a uppercase, lowercase problem. So it scans the file system to see if there's a file that matches, and it gives you that one. If there's more than one, it will actually give you a multiple choice option. Then there's check spelling on, which does that, but it also does simple letter transposition. If somebody got two letters switched around, or if uh, they put in a zero instead of an O. It will do those kinds of checks and still give you the right resource. I had a case where 
there were some, uh, some brochures that were printed up that used, um, that made it unclear whether it was a zero or an O in a URL and this fixed that. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of cases where this can solve simple problems without making anybody feel stupid. This is not great for performance because it does actually have to scan the file system for the, for the missing document. But you would have given them a 404 anyway, so you know, in the end, this is better for the end user. And if you ever write a book on the Apache web server, you will find that editors like to correct the spelling of the name of the module, and uh, you have to keep sending it back and say, no, it is actually mod spelling with one L. Somebody thought that was funny. Caching. Uh, ideally, you're going to use something like Apache Traffic Server. Yeah, I, I knew that. <laughs> However, uh, Apache HTTP does have some nice caching functionality, and I want to point out just, just one of them that's pretty cool, which, of course, Apache Traffic Server does better. If you have content on your website that is sort of dynamic, like your blog that you haven't updated since June, then it's not really important that you are serving the up to the second latest version of that to the people that are visiting your website. And, you know, as Theo mentioned in his keynote, it's very seldom important that you give people up to the second correct data. So caching is a good thing. Here's a, a configuration that allows you to say, let's cache everything for a few minutes, regardless of how fresh it is. And that is done with the cache min expire directive. In this case, I'm setting cache min expire to 3600, which is, that's seconds, right? So that's, uh, that's six minutes. Um, no? <laughs> that's an hour. You know I have a degree in math. Um, in 2.2, you can set a default expire, but you can't set a min expire. And so, you know, the, the actual cache headers in the resource itself will override that. But with cache min expire, you're, you're forcing a minimum expiration, and uh, that can reduce load on your server. If, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to skip that. Um, you, you can also set your cache server to cache things that resources say not to cache. You can say ignore cache control and ignore no store and ignore store private. You can, you can ignore those recommendations from the resource itself and cache them anyway. This can be seen as an unfriendly thing to do, but um, you know there are cases where you want to go ahead and cache that very aggressively anyway. It is important to know that if something requires authentication, then it will not be cached regardless. And finally, you can just say there are certain things that I don't wish to cache ever. I don't want to cache cookies, for example. I may not want to cache images since they're coming off the disk anyway. There's no processing involved. Or you can use Apache Traffic Server. Number 17. Mod deflate is another one of my favorite modules. This has been around for a while. And with one line of configuration, you can greatly improve the performance of your web server. This gzips content before it gets sent down to the client. Now, back in the early days of the web, you know, even on day one, clients, web clients, did gzip compression because in those days, bandwidth was a very scarce commodity, even more so than now. And so the very earliest versions of browsers knew how to handle gzip compression. So this is a feature that will benefit all browsers on all platforms simply by turning it on. And uh, you, like I said, that one, that one line of configuration, it gets gzip sent down to the client, the client uncompresses it, you can get uh, pretty significant performance it, improvements. It, it doesn't get gzipped, it gets deflated. I'm sorry, what now? It doesn't get gzipped, it gets deflated. It gets deflated. It gets I thought it was chunked. using the gzip algorithm. Well, it, it's using a slightly different algorithm. Uh, okay. So. All right, so it gets deflated. Um, 
One of the questions that I frequently get asked when I talk about mod deflate is, doesn't the time taken to compress negate the time that you're saving? And, and in practice, no. In practice, uh, with modern hardware, the gzip time is considerably less than the time that you're saving by sending a compressed, a compressed version. There's also some nice uh, logging functionality. You can log the original size and the compressed size and the compress ratio. This does, of course, work best for sites that are very text heavy. Text compresses very well. Things that are already compressed, like images and video, you don't want to try to recompress because it doesn't help you at all. And uh, yeah, so number 18. Is there a question back there? Yeah. Yeah, for um, cacheable resources, do you know if the deflated version is cached and so it doesn't need to be recompressed? Um, the cached version, I mean, sorry, the compressed version is not cached. And if you want to pre-compress things yourself, you can, in fact, gzip content and have the raw version and the .gz version and have mod negotiation hand out the correct version anyway. I've done that quite successfully. So that's, that's an alternative. Is there a... If you're, if you're talking about downstream caching, if you have the cache headers right, uh, the appropriate version will usually be cached. So oh, okay. uh, depending on what your uh, clients, what your browsers accept, they send an accept encoding header, and you can vary on that, so that, uh, or a cache can vary on that, and you will get the appropriate version. So if it's cached downstream, your ISP caches, or if you have a, a traffic server in front of it, uh, you get the appropriate version. So you don't have to store it on disk. It only happens once, sensibly. There used to be a third party module called Mod Gzip, and one of its features was that it would cache the results of the Gzip. And if you ran that on dynamic content, you would end up with millions of different gzipped versions of a resource it would fill up your hard drive really really nice i found that out the hard way <clears throat> number 18 logging to syslog um, if you've got a bunch of distributed servers maybe you want to log to a central log resource and the cheap and easy way to do that is with syslog and this is a standard feature of the error log directive and has been forever you can say error log syslog, or you can say error log syslog colon, and then specify the syslog facility that you want to log to. Then the uh, second line of configuration there is in your syslog config. You can point syslog at uh, a syslog host and log all that content to a remote syslog host. And that gives you a way to aggregate logs from all your different servers. You can, also, um, you can also specify different log levels that you want to log to different places. You can do that with syslog. That's kind of cool. Um, if you want to do this with the access log, it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, not much, though. You just have to do it through a pipe log handler. And the pipe that you want to send to is a utility called logger, which is something that comes with syslog. So you pipe your access log through logger and you give it all these various arguments and then it will log to whatever your syslog facility is. Number 19. I alluded to WebDAV earlier. I want to say just a little bit more about it because it is another one of my favorite features. Um, the, the main reason for using WebDAV is that teaching your manager how to use SCP may just be beyond your capabilities. And uh, you, you want to provide some sort of a secure file transfer mechanism. You don't want to use FTP. DAV might be the right way to do it. And it's extremely easy to configure. So here's 
a complete configuration for setting up WebDAV. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with it, WebDAV is a, uh, an HTTP-based file transfer thing. You can use it on most modern operating systems. You can simply mount it like a file, like a, a shared network drive. And then when you save files to that network drive, it's actually sending them over HTTP. And those can be versioned, as I showed a little bit earlier. But also, you can run this over SSL if you want to, if you need it to be secure. And holy cow, really? Huh. Just been told that I have 10 minutes left. Um, and like I said, you can mount this from any OS using the URL of the resource as the target. Yes? So this is 2.4 on or 2.2 as well? Uh, this is available for 1.3 and on. In 1.3, it's a third party module, but in, oh, okay. All right. In 2.0, it became, it was, it became one of the, the standard modules. Uh, there's a couple debug modules that uh, Jeff already talked about, so I'll, I'll go over pretty quickly. These are uh, mod dump IO is a way to dump all input and all output to a log file. And by all input, I mean all the headers, all of the post data, all of everything. The output is in, also all output, the entire output stream. And as you might imagine, this can generate a big log file. So it's not something that you want to do in production, typically. And then modlog forensic, Jeff also talked about. It's a way to log the beginning and end of a request in order to determine which requests never ended, something that hung indefinitely or crashed in the middle. Modlog IO is another logging module that you may be unaware of. And this solves the problem that your normal access log gives you a slightly misleading number. So here's an access log entry, and that number out at the end, 42739, is the number of bytes transferred to the client, sort of. It does not include the HTTP headers. It also doesn't include the, the size of the request. So if you have a site that allows file upload, you're totally ignoring upload size um, as well as request header size. And so you get an inaccurate view of your actual bandwidth use. Mod log IO adds a capital I and a capital O that you can add to your log file and log total input and total output. Number 22. This is um, more of a technique than a feature. If uh, you're not familiar with path info, path info is the stuff out at the end of the URL. So when, uh, when HTTPD parses a, re a, queer, uh, a request, it marches through the URL until it locates a resource that it can figure out what it is. And anything else that's on the URL is shoved into a variable called path info, which your resource will then receive to do with as it chooses. Now, I'm a fan of Terry Pratchett's writings, and one of his characters is named Granny Weatherwax. And Granny Weatherwax, who is a witch, says, the most important thing about magic is knowing when not to use it. And the same is true of mod rewrites. So although you can do, well, although you can take the query, uh, the path info and create a query string out of it using mod rewrite, which gives you, you know, a nice, pretty URL, so to speak, instead of an ugly one. Um, that may not be the most efficient way to do this. By the way, for those of you who think that throwing rewrite rules at your server will result in you making a million dollars based on your Google search results, you, there may be a few other steps involved. There may be a third step. Anyway. Um, using path info directly Gives you, the, uh, gives you a more efficient way to obtain that information than, than rewrite rules. And it also lets you make smug remarks to IR, on IRC to people who are still doing it using rewrite rules. So here's how you might do this, and I'm, I'm gonna use PHP as an example 
um, because I tend to expect a larger percentage of PHP folks in the audience than I actually have today. So bear with me a moment. First of all, I'm going to rename a resource from book.php to just book. I'm going to take off the file extension because file extensions are so 1980s anyway. And this directive here says, even though it doesn't have a file extension, I'm going to treat it like a PHP resource and it'll get executed correctly. You can use the same technique with a CGI script or whatever it is you want to use this for. Then in that code, you take the path info variable and you split it up into its component parts. You treat each one of those component parts as a variable since that's what we were doing in that nasty rewrite rule anyway. And then you do whatever it is that you wish to do in your switch statement based on the different variables that were provided. So that's a nice feature there. Number 23, oh, okay. Uh, can you go back to the files match, please? If to you, where now? Yeah, yeah if you're too, too lazy to do this, you can just turn on uh, options multi-views and do the request without the .php, and it will work just fine. You could do multi-views multi as well. That's, that's very true. So. Cool. HTTPD will find the right extension for you. Number 23 is graceful stop. And this is a new uh, argument to HTTPD, the, the binary, in 2.2. So prior to 2.2, you could do a graceful restart. And the difference between a restart and a graceful restart is with a graceful restart, you actually wait for existing connections to complete before you disconnect them. If you simply do a restart, then any connections that are midway through will simply be dropped, and then the server process will be restarted. So that can be unfortunate if you have long-running uh, long requests or if you have large file downloads that would simply be dropped in, the mid in midstream. Graceful restart solved that problem. Graceful stop solves a similar problem. And this is if you have, for example, a bunch of backend servers that are behind a proxy. You want to take one of them down. Then you use a graceful stop to bring it down. It allows it to complete any ongoing requests before it brings it down, and then you can take that out of the proxy rotation. So fairly simple feature there, but um, really nice to have when you need it. Number 24, mod authn alias. So mod authn alias allows you to have multiple authentication sources of the same type. The authentication provider directive allows you to point at one particular authentication resource. So if you have, um, say, you're authenticating against a flat file and also against LDAP, you can specify those two authentication sources. But if you have two LDAP authentication sources, you have to come up with something to call them other than LDAP, because they're both LDAP. Mod authn alias gives you that functionality. So um, I guess that would look better if it was left aligned. But anyway, that second block there says authn provider alias LDAP. And I'm going to call it LDAP alias 1 and define my first LDAP server. And then I do the same thing for my other alias. And I define a second LDAP server. I can, then, uh, I can then configure authentication using I've lost a slide. Huh. OK, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show this second example, because somewhere along the line, I've deleted a slide. Um, if you have two password files, flat files, that you want to authenticate against, you create an alias for each one. In this case, I'm calling them file1 and file2. 
And then I'm going to call auth basic provider file one, file two. And that says check file one. And if it does not return an authoritative response, then check file two. So if, uh, if you check in the first password file and it can't find your username in there, it won't return denied, it will return declined, which means I don't know and I'm not authoritative, go look somewhere else. If you have somewhere else to check, then you have that option for a, a second check at that. Number 25, protocol modules. So now I'm being told I have 10 minutes, and so that works out about right. In Apache 2.0, so this has been a while now, uh, we started talking about removing everything from the core and leaving the core as small as possible. So the joke was at the time that it was no longer HTTPD, it was just D. And uh, the protocol was completely pluggable. So I, I think some people took the joke a little bit too far. And uh, so now you can run, instead of HTTPD, you can run a POP3 server using the D product and mod POP3. You can remove HTTP support entirely from, from uh, HTTPD. And, and once again, I'm completely serious. But uh, there's also, when you install HTTPD, it comes with mod echo. And mod echo is an example module that shows you how to implement a protocol module. It, is, as the name implies, a simple echo module, which means you send a packet to it and it sends it back. You send a, you know, a word or a phrase to it and it echoes back to you. There are also a number of other protocol modules that run on the HTTPD stack. There's mod spamd from the Spam Assassin project, which does spam filtering. There's mod FTPD, which lets you run an FTP server. And there's also mod SMTPD, which I don't think is particularly mature right now, but you can run a basic mail server on that. Um, and, you know, protocol modules can be any protocol. And this may seem a little bit silly, but it does allow you to have a common authentication architecture across multiple services. And that's, that can be really important particularly if you already know really well how to configure authentication on, on one platform. This gives you a way to extend that to a bunch of different services. Put all of your eggs in one basket, so to speak. What, nobody laughed at that one? Okay. Uh. The event MPM is now the default in Apache 2.4, and the event MPM solves the keep alive problem. So for those of you who are not aware of the keep alive problem, let me show you a picture of it. This is the uh, mod status page for httpd.apache.org several days before it was converted over to use event. And what you will see there is a bunch of Ks. And K indicates that a server process is in keep alive mode. Now, keep alive is, it's a good thing. Keep alive is an uh, extension to HTTP that, or it's a feature of HTTP rather, that allows you to make more than one request over a single HTTP socket connection. And so if conceptually, imagine you have a web page that has 10 images in it, you could make all of those requests all at once. Well, not really, one after the other, you make the, the request for the page and then the request for each of the images all over the same connection and not have the overhead of opening and closing 10 connections. So that's the idea. However, when you get done with one of those requests, HTTPD has to wait for your next one. And how long it waits is configurable. Um, in those days, the default was, I believe, five seconds. And five seconds is forever when you're having hundreds of requests per second. And so you get a situation like this, where you have a couple hundred processes that are waiting for the next request, which is never going to come. 
And so you're using half of your server resources on processes that are just sitting there doing nothing. Then we upgraded to the event MPM and that problem went away. Um, and this was another screenshot just a few days later. So the way that it does this is that those keep alive sockets, and I'm, I'm grossly oversimplifying here and getting away with it because I still have four more things to do in the next five minutes. And uh, it takes all those keep alive sockets and it shoves them off into a queue until it needs them. And if it doesn't need them, then they just expire in the time given. Number 27. ModDBD is a module that does database connection pooling. And this provides, it, it's not a module that you use directly in your configuration file. It's a module that other modules use when they want to talk to databases. And um, they, you can auth against, or you can make queries against, uh, and I just had the list yesterday. I was going to remember it. Um, free TDS, Postgres, MySQL, Oracle, and another one that I can't remember. SQLite. SQLite. That's right. Which one? ODBC. ODBC. Okay. And uh, so, for example, you can use mod auth and DBD to authenticate against these databases, and that looks something like this. You set up a connection to your Postgres database, providing your username and password in your hopefully very secure configuration file, and you say, I'm going to authenticate using that SQL query. It takes the username that was provided, it does a query, and then it returns true or false. You can also use ModDBD directly from rewrite map in 2.4. You can use a rewrite map that does a database query in order to do URL mapping. So that's cool. Mod negotiation, and this was alluded to earlier, um, if you want to make requests without file extensions, you can do this using mod negotiation with one line of configuration. So you can use example.com slash index instead of example.com index.php. Uh, one reason for doing this is that 99% of your audience has no idea what .php means and therefore is likely to type it wrong. So having URLs that don't have file extensions is better for URLs that you're going to read over the phone to someone. The other thing is that if you choose to change your infrastructure from one type to another, and that results in a file name change, that doesn't change your URLs. So here's the configuration line. You add this one configuration line, and it does the right thing in most cases be sure that you test. The accept language header in your browser can also result in negotiating between different file, be, between different translation languages. If you have files available in different languages that have a file extension indicating that language, then these will automatically be negotiated between. If you want to see this in action, go to the Apache web server documentation website and change your browser preference to some other language and reload the page, and you'll magically see it in that other language. 29, I have two minutes left, and I have two things left. So pluggable MPMs in 2.2 and earlier, you have to rebuild to change your MPM in 2.4. You can build everything up front and choose between them with load module. One cool thing to do here is actually run multiple daemons using different MPMs off the same binary. So that's, that can be handy if you want the benefits of one and the benefits of other, you can simply proxy accordingly. Number 30. Oh look, it's the missing slide. Huh, that's weird. Anyway, uh, mod authens LDAP lets you do authentication against an LDAP server, including your Active Directory server, with uh, a variety of keywords. 
The configuration example here is actually 2.2 syntax. It's much more flexible in 2.4, and I showed some of that yesterday. Hopefully, you were all there and paying close attention. And then finally, um, this has been mentioned numerous times this week, but can't get enough of it. There is a expression evaluation syntax that's been added in 2.4, and it adds and it says see slides later because I rearranged my slides yesterday. But uh, I've shown several examples of this expression evaluation syntax during the course of this talk. What the heck? There's another one. Bonus slides. Uh, number 32. Mod substitute allows you to, it, with one configuration directive, modify content as it gets served out to the client. I showed you a silly way to do that with mod X filter earlier. This is a much more efficient way. Um, I've got a bad word filter in there, and then um, more usefully, you can actually switch out, say, a host name from a back-end server to a front-end server. I am totally out of time. That's where my slides are. That's where you can email me. If you have any more questions, get on IRC and ask us there. Thank you very much. <laughs>